What's going on, my guy? All right, what's going on, my guy? Hey, so you you just want to go by Winston this time, or or what? What did I go by last time? I think we went by Academy, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. So Road, Road Ready Academy yeah. is just where yeah yeah you know I have all the information for the school and all that. But nah, you know, everybody know me as Winston. You know what I'm saying? And I didn't want like for people to look at me as Road Ready Academy, which is you right. know the business. So all right, you know, so I just kind of went ahead with what everybody knew. All right. Yeah. All right, Winston in the building. My guy, welcome back on, to the on. channel, man. I, I think the last time we talked, we talked a few times. I think the last time was like early this year. You you ran into a situation where somebody came outside and turned off the reefer. We we talked about that. We we talked about your academy and everything before that, but you're back. On TikTok, man, <laughs> and dropping some major jewels, my guy. Hey, man, shoot. I, I just felt like, you know, I just needed to let people know the reality of trucking, you know. So that's the main thing. I just wanted people to know that it can get that real. You know what I mean? You have so many people that hold the trucking space, and they put out a lot of information. But I feel like, you know, you, you got to see both sides you know you can't just look at it as one side so that's all i was doing just really just putting out my story you know what i mean as always man as always as always and much respect to you for doing that so we we're gonna take this and break it down and unpack each package right here so first thing first how was your christmas bro man it was good it was good I, you know i got a chance to anytime i get time i take it with family you know what i'm saying i have three kids i'm married so anytime i'm free I try to, you know, focus on that, focus on family-oriented things. So my Christmas was good because, you know, I just got a chance to really just relax and just, you know, get some things done and, you know, involve my family in it. So it was pretty good, man. What about you? Man, family's good. I I I spent time with my family, my son, his wife, my moms. We we pretty much had a pretty good weekend. We we pretty much just spent Christmas just just to relax and reset. But over the weekend, we we pretty much went out, did the family thing, shop, and all that other good stuff. So so yeah, it it was awesome. It was, it was awesome. And I I I take time like that to be valuable because I that's that's one of the main reasons why I don't drive on the holidays Thanksgiving and Christmas any other holidays yeah not a big deal but pretty much Thanksgiving and Christmas is is we don't get paid for it but still but still I'm like yeah I get, just give me off because I, I don't want to be stuck at nobody's truck stop you know what I'm saying right all right so family being you got three kids and you're married and it's important to you being a truck driver, you know, how hard is that on your family when they when they be out of the house for like maybe about a couple of weeks to a month? How how does that affect the family, especially the kids? All right. So the weird thing is, you know, I became a truck driver because I wanted to spend more time with my family. And I mean, you know, saying it like that, a lot of people would think that kind of crazy uh, because it definitely does. But that was my mindset when I initially got my CDL. And uh, it's been able, I've been able to spend a lot more time with my family, actually, because I, I don't, I don't go out on the road at all. You know, I've been local since I've had a CDL. And I got a CDL back in 2017, and uh, I've only ran local. So I had to figure out how to make trucking for me where I'm making money. And at the same time, I'm coming home not just every night, but early in the day, uh, which is a tough combination. So I had to focus on freight that would allow me to do that. You know what I mean? So I, I was out on the road for probably about 30 days before I realized that it just wasn't for me at all. You know what I mean? So I never went you know, the all states and, you know, I, I didn't do all that. You know, I just been local, man. So, Bro, you're one of the lucky ones, my guy. Yeah. So you got your your CDL back in 2017 and, and you just lucked up and got local? Like, how did you manage that? Because let let people, let drivers tell it. They, they having a hard time finding a local position. They have to go out over the road. They have to get their experience before they before they come back around and go local. See, what I what I realized is that, you know, I was very I was very stubborn, you know what I mean, when I first started. A lot of guys told me, you know, you gotta be in that truck out on the road for two years 
treated like a prison is what they would say. And when you pay your dues and when you, you know, and when you go out there, you come back in, then you can probably find some local, which is actually not true at all. It's actually, you know what I'm saying? It's actually like, I look at it like a brainwasher because most of these guys that's going to tell you that, all of them do drive in. I don't do drive in. You know what I'm saying? Because the drive in, the local, it doesn't pay as well as other local engines and trucks. So most guys, they're going to be stuck, you know, with that mentality like, okay, I got to go out on the road because if you do a drive in, that's how the dispatchers do. You know what I'm saying? They'll send you everywhere, but there's, there's something called local account where that freight, let's just, let's just start off with drive in. Like, you could be running a local drive in paper route. For example, I was working a paper route called West Route. And that route, it pretty much, you know what I'm saying, they had a, a plant in Alabama, but still, you could run that account locally in Georgia. And they might send you out to Alabama, but you're coming back. I went from running over the road for probably 30 days to straight to Intermodal. That's where I made money at. You know what I'm saying? I was making roughly $70,000 a year back in 2017, 2018, and then coming home as a night. Because that freight, when it leaves like the rail yard, it goes out, and then it, you got to bring that container back. So I found out that in a month would keep me local and it would keep me making a little bit more money than driving. But again, I think it's like a brainwashing because, you know, the industry will make it seem like local is not possible. But in fact, when local... If you want me to be real honest, I think you can make more money being local than going over the road, period, because you only going to have one load when you're over the road. You got to run it from, let's say, Georgia, Kentucky. That's one load. I don't know if you split the load or whatever. You got multi drop, whatever the case is, you didn't take the same. But when you're talking about local, you might have to do 10 loads in a day. And then them loads, they can't pay you by the mile, but they might have to pay you three, four hundred dollars per load. So to me, you know, when I looked at it, I'm like, man, you make way more money. But the problem is, most guys don't want to run like that. So that's, that's, that's the headache. You know, traffic, stopping and going, hopping in that trailer, hitting out, that's a lot. So I, I was going to do anything it took to be local. So for me, I'm like, okay, that's just a part of it. It's just exercise. But to be honest with you, no, I, you can make a lot of money being local. I've met a lot of guys, man. I've seen on the operators, man, do $2,000 a day on accounts that people don't even know that exist. But guys who make the money like that, they're not going to be vocal about it. You know, I've met guys, man, making two, 3000 a day. And if we said, hey, man, I don't even talk about it. I don't even tell nobody. You know what I'm saying? So that that's, that's what I think. I think it's just like a a brainwashing but in reality local is where it's at local is where it's at man so let me let me touch on what you just said about that you have to go out over the road two years and yeah. some drivers say you got to treat it as a prison no i i hate that term honestly i i, I hate that term don't don't tell me I got to treat trucking as a prison. Don't tell me that that this truck is 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 my prison. No. No. Prison is prison. Okay? Prison is when somebody wakes you up in the morning, somebody tells you when to eat, somebody tells you when to take a shower, somebody say you got a couple of minutes outdoors, somebody say you can you 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 you, you got a couple of minutes to watch TV. No. No. No, trucking is not a prison. You get up, you can get out, you can walk around, you can breathe the free air, you can you can watch TV, you can you can move. I I hate that term, man. And and a lot of people just use it so freely. Like, yeah, it's just like prison. No, and I asked a guy, a CDL driver, and he was in prison. Like he did like prison time. I asked him. I was like. Bro, so it's the correlation between trucking and prison is the same. My guy said no. He said no. He said I could get up and drive from state to state. I will be in I, I will be in Ohio one day and be in Texas the next. Who can do that in prison? So so yeah, I, I, I hate that terminology and I hate when, when drivers correlate that with with that because I I've been in jail in my youth, trust me. I didn't like it, so I know I, I know this ain't prison for me. C come up with a new with an analogy. The only the only thing that kept my mind like really clean away from you know believing what I was being told by every trucker is that you know I just didn't I just didn't talk to him. So when I was out on the road, you know, so I shouldn't say out on the road, but when I was like moving around in more places, I, I didn't speak to drivers like that because I realized 
they all sort of had the same mindset. And I was like, man, I don't want to believe that trucking is, you know what I'm saying, just depressing. And I got to, I can't see my family for two years and all that. I didn't want to believe that to be true. So I just kept to myself. And I never really spoke. And when guys would talk to me, you know what I'm saying, they'll try to give me advice. I'll just smile like, yeah, man, that sounds good. But I would not let them know what I was thinking because it sounds crazy to say I'm local and, I, and it's making money. In fact, I remember one time I did a regional load because when you run a regional, you might as well call that local because you could be running, like for me, it's Georgia, right? So I can run to Tennessee and back. I'm coming home, though. But I met a guy at a warehouse out there, and he specifically was saying, like, yeah, man, you know, you run local. Like, you ain't going to make no money doing that, man. You need to come out here and make some real money. So I asked him, like, how much was he making? You know what I'm saying? And he told me. The guy didn't know because I didn't tell him, but I was making more than him. I was running a regional, local, you know, in and out of the state and home every night, making more than him. You know what I'm saying? 18 to 2,000 dollars a week and he had no clue but I'm like well if he think that's the only way to make three hundred to two thousand dollars a week is to hit the road and max out your clock every day then that's just his world but to me I'm like man I'd rather be three four hours in a day make the same amount of money and be home sleep in my bed than to do it any other way and I'm not saying it's the right way to trust but for me with a family, you know, I can't sacrifice my family thinking that I'm providing for them because I don't feel like it's the best of both worlds. I feel like I'm taking a loss on one side, I'm trying to gain financially, so I'm, I'm never going to really be happy making the money. I wanted to be happy making my money, so I'm like, shoot, I ain't going to be happy unless I'm really, you know, spending more time at home, so I got to make, I got to figure out a way to figure out all the local opportunities, all the local freight, all of that, so, you know, that's what led me into buying those type of trucks, too, so... Okay. Okay. And, and and again, it's it's different people, different mind states, different different situations. Because for you, it's all about family, and that's why you did what you do. But then there's somebody else that might be in the same position, but that don't have that family aspect. And they'd be like, okay, well, over the road is for me, and they can make they can right, equally exactly. they could equally make just about the same amount of money as you are making uh, locally. Okay, so let's talk about local for a minute. You mentioned intermodal. So intermodal basically go down to the ports, let them drop the trailer on the chassis. You take it, you drop it, you get unloaded, and you bring the 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 intermodal or the intermodal trailer back. Drop it or get unloaded because they had to take it off the chassis. And then probably hook up to another another trailer. Now, being that said, there's not much physicality in in intermodal driving, right? Yeah. Basically, you're there. You just have to make sure that the that the locks is locked, and when you get to your delivery, just open up the open up the doors, back up, and boom. But you said you you can make as much money as a drive-in. But would would you suggest? intermodal over over food service because you from what drivers say they can make the same amount of money with food service but they're they're putting in the work so, so what i would say is that what i would say is that every everything in trucking has to pay money you know what i'm saying if it's being put in a trailer it's got to pay money period like there's no free freight there's no shippers sending anything off that they're not paying for you know what I realized is that, the, you know, trucking is filled with a lot of corruption. And any, anytime you got an uh, industry that got money in it, you got to expect corruption. That's just how it works. It's hand in hand. It don't matter if we're talking about cars. It, it could be whatever. It, it could be anything. Diamonds. It don't matter. It, if, it, if it's got potential to make money, you, you have to have corruption in it. So what I realized is that a lot of, you know what I'm saying, the controversy that go on in trucking is always centered around driving. It's, it's always that freight right there that you see people going after. You know, we could be talking about autonomous trucking. You look at all these videos, they're not doing autonomous trucking commercial with logging trucks, flatbed, reefers, and tankers. They they doing that pulling dry vans on the back. So that's where all the experimenting is happening. So I'm saying that to say dry van is going to pay money, but it's just too much going on for us to really see the money filter out to our hands as, as drivers. We're not going to see it because that industry right there, you know, people been planting seeds and having relationships for over 200 years in dry van. You know, that's that, that, that right there is like, you know, trying to enter something the mafia controls. 
But I feel like we're in a modal flatbed food, all that, all that type of freight is not as, you know what I'm saying, governed. Like you can get in those industries and actually make money and actually see some type of profit. I don't care what it is because I, I believe food services might even pay uh, the most when we're talking about, you know, running local and stuff like that. I, I used to run food loads and I was making $2,000 a day. Uh, the most I ever made was like, I think right under 5000 in one day going home. And I knew guys that was making $2,000 back to back. I'm talking about every single day doing food service loads, multi-stop loads, where they, they run in to different Sonics. You know, I don't know if you're familiar with that franchise, but they're dropping off the, you know, the food for Sonics. Or, you know, I did Piccadilly one time. That load paid me $3,000. You know what I'm saying? I couldn't finish in the day because, you know, it was a lot of boxes to drop off. It darn there took me about two and a half days because of my time. You know, I ain't want to work it overnight and all that. So I stretched it out. But to me, those loads pay a lot more now. You know what I'm saying? That that involves physical labor. So they have to kind of, you know, pay you for your time and everything like that. But it could be, you know, in a mode, it could be flatbed. I, I think that I've seen more profit being on the ground come out of those areas. I, I haven't really seen it to where dry van was just the best thing to go do. You know what I'm saying? I think most people that hop in this industry, that's what they go for. You know, you get a CDL, you going in a dry van automatically. So we're just kind of programmed for that industry and thinking that's the end of all. But, you know, you can make money in, in any old industry. Like I said, it's just a lot tougher to do it with that one. You know what I'm saying? Now, you also touched on uh, early, uh, earlier. Hold on. All right, so you touched on earlier of information. You said a lot of a lot of drivers that you did talk to and doing your travels and everything. You you listened to what they have to say, but you didn't want to give out your information. You you pretty much was there to listen and learn pretty much. Do you feel with especially with social media being the way it is right now? Do you feel that it is a lot of information, misinformation? or too much information in trucking? I think that I'm sorry about my voice. Hopefully yeah, my words come out, you know, called a sore, just a sore throat over the holidays with the weather. But I think it's all of that. You know, I think that you have a lot of people like on the internet side, and I get accused of this a lot from the industry. Guys don't like that. You know what I mean? Putting out information. You got a lot of people who come out here and they make some money and then they go run and, you know, tell people, especially a couple of years ago, you know, with you know, the pandemic and everything, people was making crazy amounts of money. I remember that everybody was just going around telling everybody on and off the internet, in the streets, everybody was talking. And, you know, that, that lured a lot of people in to come inside the industry. You have a lot of misinformation in this industry. And a lot, and some of it is by design. Some of it, you know, I try to tell, and, and the reason why I didn't talk to guys is because I realized that, you know, most guys was really brainwashed. And I, and I saw a pattern. The longer the person was in the industry, the less they knew about the industry and the more stuck they were in their ways. And I tell people all the time, too, I said, man, my uncle has been in the business for over 40 years, but he's the last one I would talk to about business for trucking because he's not interested in the business. You know what I'm saying? If he, if he was interested in the business, he would be on the side, on the side of it that is, is going to get him further. But, you know, he was an owner operator, leased the land star, you know, never really wanted to put on authority and stuff like that. I mean, he never really went past, you know, working. Like he had contracts with FedEx, many thousands of dollars. You know what I'm saying? I'm talking about four or 500,000 a year. But he wasn't interested in nothing else other than what he knew, which was being, you know, having a contract with a, a FedEx or working on a Landstar. He, he wasn't interested in nothing else. But when I came in, it was a lot more I wanted to know about the business. So the pattern that I saw was the more I talked to the guys who've been in it the longest, they would give me information that it'll, it'll help me drive, you know what I'm saying, like be safe out here, which that's the most important thing I learned from, from the veterans and the guys that's been in it a long time is that they were concerned about safety, and, and that helped me out tremendously. Now, when we're talking about understanding logistics and we're talking about how freight moves and we're talking about you know, capitalizing on different opportunities, you know, government contracting and local contracting and federal contracting and stuff like that. Nobody I knew or came in contact with was talking about that stuff. You know what I'm saying? It was just like, 
guys were really focused on what they've been doing for the last 20 years, and it's worked for them. If they've been running a triangle for 20 years, they say, hey, man, you need to get out here, you know, run up to, to, to Texas and run over here, run back down, and, you know, you'll be able to make a living, right? That's the type of stuff I, I saw. So when I was keeping quiet with, on, on what, you, what I said earlier, I didn't want the negative backlash from me coming with something different or me coming with a different mindset because it would be a clash because everybody would be like, nah, that's not going to work. Local don't pay. That's not going to work. You shouldn't try that. That's what I was getting. So I'm like, man, I don't, I don't really want to hear that. I just, if anything, let me see for myself. You know what I'm saying? So that's why I keep quiet. That, that's because, you know, every truck and business that you see on the road, or I should say it like this, every truck that you see on the road, it's its own economy. The way they got sleep, the way they got eat, the way they got run, the type of money he makes, it has nothing to do with the truck beside him. You can see 10 million trucks, and each truck runs differently based on how they make their money. So when you ask somebody a question, you're really asking about their experience, their mindset, and that's going to limit you. Because automatically, you're going to look at what somebody else is doing, and you're going to be like, oh, man, you know, that's what I'm going to have to do. So taking advice in trucking is a very serious thing because you're only going to be as good as the advice that you take in, and you, you're only going to go as far as the advice that you take in because you can't see beyond what people tell you. So I, I, I had to really just expand and learn about trucking from all parts of trucking. Learn about trucking through the, through the lens of a broker. Learn about trucking through the lens of a dispatcher. Learn about trucking through somebody who's doing dump trucks. Learn about it through somebody who's doing government contracts. Learn about it from somebody who sells tires. I needed to see all of that, especially the mechanical side. I had to learn about trucking through that lens as well to understand it on this level. You know what I mean? So for me, I think that you got all kinds of information in trucking, and it makes perfect sense. Because it's, it's, it's different from a lot of different businesses, man. Like, some, a lot of businesses have a blueprint. You know, you do this, you do that. And, you know, we know that not, a large percentage of startups fail. But trucking is a different type of business, man. It's, it's just it's so independent that, you know, people think the way they truck is the only way to truck. And that kind of really makes it very, very complicated. I mean, you could be sitting next to a guy that makes half a million dollars a year and a guy making 100 k a year. And it's just like, man, that's two different worlds. He could be pulling that. He could be pulling an RGN trailer. He could be pulling a hopper trailer. And you pulling a dry van trailer. So it's just like, there's so much conversations to be had. It's, it's just a lot happening at one time. So you just have to be very, very wise and calculated if you really want to make something about this type of industry. All right. All right. That's awesome, man. Awesome take. I appreciate that, man. You Do you think, again, back to the social media aspect, with a lot of these drivers that's coming out or has came out. And as you said yourself, you know, the pandemic pretty much brought in an influx of, of drivers thinking that they're going to get rich quick and and make all this buku money. All the drivers that's, that's in it now, you got drivers that's looking at each other now like, man, this man capping, this, this man ain't making this, and this, that, and the third. I just did a reaction video on a prime driver. He's a lease driver, finished up his third lease, if I'm not mistaken, with, uh, with prime. And he said that, and let me make sure I get, make sure I clear this because when I said in my, my uh, reaction video, I said that the driver made a million dollars. No, the truck made a million dollars. A lot of people, came in they couldn't believe it he broke it down by the numbers and everything i was surprised that it was a a, a prime driver a, a mega carrier i i never heard of 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 a driver that came out and claimed hey my truck made this amount of money i i've seen drivers talk about six figures all the time and that's that's what they talk about they yeah i, I made six figures a year like okay well Break it down in money. How much you took home? What's 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 the net, not the gross? You know what I'm saying? But with all that said, with all that said, again, with drivers looking at drivers and listening to their stories and watching their videos and stuff like that, do you think that there's jealousy amongst us? Oh, yeah. I believe this industry is driven by all of that. You know what I mean? It's driven by envy. It's driven by jealousy. It's very militant. And uh, the guys that, you know, did trucking, you know what I'm saying, before us, you know, you, you have a lot of good men, you know, that laid the foundation and, and, and ran everywhere. But those men were loyal. 
you know, they're very loyal guys. You know, every trucker that I know before my time are very loyal. They stick with one company. They stick with one truck. But unfortunately, they were loyal to a lot of sharks, a lot of thieves, a lot of liars, a lot of people who play games and, you know, just kind of brainwash them. You know what I'm saying? And we see a lot less loyalty now. And that's because people don't, people not going to waste time and people trying to come up quick. So people don't stick with one thing no more long enough to even see what is going to happen. Even if it's going good, guys will hop off of stuff and they'll just hop into something else. They'll just do this for six months. You know what I'm saying? It's a lot of things. But I believe, you know, the internet has made it to where a lot of people who, you know, watch what other people are doing, it's very hard for them to focus on their lane and be content with what they have. You know what I'm saying? Everybody wants a nice, shiny truck. Everybody wants a clean truck. Everybody wants to ride around, you know, with a female that they pick up or a male, whatever. Um, that's what people like. And whether or not you can afford it, that's what we're going to do. We're going to go for those things we cannot afford. We're going to pay that truck payment. That truck payment, $3,000, man, we can't, we, we going to ride around in that truck. And that's, that all goes into the issues is that you can make money out of this industry by avoiding all of the costly expenses. Like, Getting a truck will cost you three thousand dollars a month. A lot of guys will say, "Well, that's the only way to truck because you get a brand new truck, it's not gonna break down." You know what I'm saying? You can run the money up at a half. A yeah, that's very. That sounds very good. But I know guys who've done that, and they just realize, man, like the freight volume is not paying them enough to make a payment like that and to survive the industry. So I feel like you do have a lot of envy happening. You do have a lot of people, you know, wanting to ride better or look. You know what I'm saying? More accomplished than the next guy. Everybody want to say I own a trucking business. I mean, that's a problem. And that's a problem within itself because we all are competing against one another. My truck versus your truck. I feel like I see a lot of systematic type of trucking going on where people kind of roll and pack or have their own little system and they win big. I normally see this with like oversized freight. You know, you got people that run freight and they all know each other and they all kind of do what they do. So it, 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 it is a price that we're paying for the glory of saying I got mine or I made it or I bought this truck. You know, it's, we, you know, being ambitious in trucking is a very dangerous thing. I think while ambition is good, the reality of what trucking is, is people not really seeing it. They don't understand that you can't really say that there is a trucking industry that exists technically because nothing moves without freight. You could buy a truck and if you ain't got freight, then what did you buy? You know what I'm saying? So I believe that we have a freight industry and we got trucks to haul that freight. And when you start looking at it like that, you're like, wait a minute, man. So where's my focus? Is it in the truck or is it in the freight? You know what I'm saying? You buy that nice, shiny truck and it's sitting or you try to find a load or you ain't making the money. It's like, to me, I'm into freight right now. My mindset is like, okay, forget the trucking industry. I need to understand freight. I need to figure out how can I get loads enough to move? Because if, if I, let's say I lock me down a contract. I could take that contract and go buy some trucks off of it. So what is the truck at the end of the day? But, you know, that's that's where everybody's focus is, you know. So that's my take on it. All right. All right. All right. So later down, you transitioned into owner operating. Am I correct in saying that? You you came back. You made a TikTok explaining, and correct me if I'm wrong, your 15K truck got you into a 300K home. Am I five? Five thousand dollar truck got you into a three hundred dollar three hundred thousand dollar home. You see my five thousand dollar truck? It helped me to pay for this three hundred thousand dollar house. I don't care what people tell you. Stop listening to these people that's telling you to go spend a hundred K on a truck so you can ride around and look good. I run local, I'm home every night. I don't spend hours in the truck on the road. I wanna come home to my family and I truck the smart way. You need to do the same thing and don't let these people put you in debt from peer pressure. And a lot of them ain't gonna tell you. They're not gonna keep it real with you. A lot of truck drivers are in debt. A lot of truck drivers gotta borrow from the auntie, you know, brother, uh, uncle, whoever's gonna be willing to lend to them. And everybody got somebody in their family that's a trucker that's calling around, you know what I'm saying, for money because they're trucking the shop. We, 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 we already know that. So I'm just putting y'all on game, man. Don't let these people fool you. Well, my exact words on the video was it helped me to pay for this three hundred thousand dollar home just so everybody can get proper context. But it's all the same, you know what I'm saying? 
without that truck, I wouldn't be able to, you know, have provided for myself, be able to do that. You know, I bought that house when I first became an owner operator. I had just left being a company driver and I was running for a couple of months and I decided like, okay, we should start looking at house. You know what I mean? And that truck that I bought, that first truck that I bought, because uh, I, I had a couple of people say, hey man, I thought you said your truck was 5000 I bought more than one truck. That was the last truck I bought. First truck I bought was 11500 That's the truck that started it all. And when I bought that truck for that price, people didn't believe that. So that truck was worth about 30000 I've never spent over that when it came to a truck. So the $5,000 truck is something that I got last year. Quarter to, I had a truck about a year. Just about that. And I didn't believe I was going to find no truck for that price. It wasn't nothing that was premeditated. You know, it was like, I was searching for a truck, and I'm like, man, I need to, I need to take this 20000 and go get me a truck. You know what I'm saying? I was looking for a good loan. Man, that. I, was like, I had cash. I was like, uh, I think I found me a truck for 20000 And my wife, she reminded me, she was like, hey, why don't we search for a truck for 5000 And I had got mad because I'm like, wait a minute, we talking about sound crazy. And then I had remembered that, wait a minute, man, anybody going to find a truck for $5,000 is going to be me because I wrote a freaking book on it. I literally wrote an e-book about out of trucks with dirt cheap, but I had forgot my own words and my own vision because I was so focused on finding a truck because I needed I needed one. Uh, so when I started looking, I started calling my buddies, you know, some of my friends that I knew. And uh, one of my friends was like, hey, man, because I was, I was doing a local flatbed. And, uh, you know, we rode in a crew. So my buddy said, hey, man, you got to... You got one of the guys, he'll sell it for you for about 7000 like, hey, man, ain't no way that guy going to sell that truck. The guy, the guy had that truck for like 10 years, and the guy that was driving it was like 70 years old. I found out that the truck was in a mechanic shop because it had got damaged, and the guy was retiring. So I approached him. I said, hey, I need a truck, another truck, because I'm, I'm running my current truck. I'm looking to purchase an additional truck so I can grow my fleet. So I said to him, man, I'm trying to... Trying to put you in the truck, and I heard that you would sell them. He was like, Yeah, yeah, I would. I was like, Man, I'll pay you five for it. He paused. He said, Yeah, 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 I'll, I'll do it. This is Jamaica. It was more like, Yeah, man, all right, all right. That's what he said. Met up with him, pulled the cash, paid for the truck, took the title, went to the mechanic shop, put the truck out. The mechanic came out, like, Hey, man, I'm trying to buy this truck. I was like, Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was like, Well, you know, we'll buy it back from you, man, because we've been working on this truck for so many years and we wanted the engine. So I was like, I'm going to think about it, man. Man, I took that truck pass off his lot when he did come to where I couldn't move it. And uh, I've been running that truck ever since. I had a driver in there for about seven months. I ran oversized with it. 60,000 pound load, 50,000 pound load. Nothing was wrong with that truck besides it having like a broken fan clutch on the front. So I had to go to Richard Kearns. That's a junkyard here in Georgia. That's, you know, you can't find a certain parts sometimes. And sometimes, matter of fact, I went to International, they wanted 500 for it. So I said, heck no, nah, I ain't paying that for no darn fan blade, fan clutch, whatever. It was, it's a fan blade, fan clutch is different, but the blade, they wanted like $500. So now nah, I said, I, I can get this used. So I went to Richard Kearns, and that man found it himself. True story. I couldn't find it. I walked in, he pulled it out of stuff. And I replaced that and kept driving. And I put some new injectors in there. And that was it. And those injectors was just because I thought I needed to put injectors in there. But I, I really didn't. I, I was like, man, I just bought this truck. And I want to make sure it's got enough power. I'm like, man, I spent five. Like, man, I could put two in there. So I went and bought it. Then the mechanic was like, man, the injector's good. I'm like, nah. It's going to go to Tennessee, so I want to be sure, sure. You know what I'm saying? Bought them and just didn't even need them. But, yeah, that's, that's a real story, man. And uh, you can find trucks for that price all the time. Sometimes you get a truck for free. And when I say that, it sounds crazy. But when I break it down, it's a different world, though. So you, you'll never get a truck for free if you don't understand the mechanic industry. All mechanic shops get trucks for free, all of them. Because people can't pay for them repair bills a lot of times. And a lot of times, guys abandon their truck. A lot of times, guys just don't come back. You don't know what happens. This happens at truck parking lot. This happened at mechanic shops. And I know because I used to work at one. And I saw people abandon trucks. And I saw them do title liens and take trucks over. And they just wanted their freaking money back on, on the part and on the freaking labor. So a mechanic, they won't tell you, but they got trucking businesses too. And they put they, those same trucks on the road they get for people coming in, can't pay their bills, or a, a mechanic is going to offer you the buy a truck that you're trying to sell. You'll go to a mechanic, like, hey man, I'm trying to fix this truck up and sell it. And he's like, man, I'll buy it the way it is. Or you go in there and he'll be working on another truck, but man, I want that truck. And he said, hey man, I'll trade it. I got it off of this customer. 
So it's so much transactions that happen at a game shop. You won't believe it. It might as well be a truck dealership, to be honest with you. You know what I'm saying? It's so much transactions with and buying trailers and stuff that happens. You'll never know that these guys be getting trucks for free, man. And I shouldn't say for free because they got to, you know, depend on what happened, but... I knew some I knew some mechanics that filed some lean on people's trucks, man, and they got them titles. And they just put them on the road. Sometimes guys will be going out of business and they'll say, screw that crap. You know, it was a it was a truck repair shop down in the making. Man, those guys left about twenty trucks down there, man. Some trucks had been on that on that property for like fifteen years, accumulated all them trucks. And all they did was turn around and sell them to people on the shop closed down. So it's, it's a big reality on buying cheap trucks. That's some that's some tea drop right there, y'all. That's that's some tea. Y'all listening. Listen to what this man said. That's some tea right there. Y'all, y'all going into uh, into these trucking dealerships, spending all that kind of money, and all y'all gotta do is just get online or do the yellow pages and see where you can find these uh, repair shops that probably might have a truck or two on there that, that they might want to get rid of. Listen to this, man. That's some good tea. That's what I'm talking about, man, bro. Man, I, look, man, I, I, could, I could show you so many people, man, uh, around my city. We got a mechanic named Dog. Everybody know him in uh, Latonia area. You, you can say, you can walk around Latonia and go to any mechanic shop and say, hey, y'all know that. And they'll say, yeah, yeah, we know him. Man, dogs sell trucks to us, man. We buy trucks from that man. I ain't bought a truck personally, but I had a driver that was working for me that bought his truck from him. I'm talking about a mechanic shop. And when they sell you a truck, that truck going to run because they did the freaking work on it. And it's going to be as good as what they say. So they say, hey, man, I rebuilt this engine and the customer ain't come back. Nine times out of ten, that's what it is. Because if you buy it and he's lying, he know you got to come back to him. He know you got to come right back. So if you if you if that's your mechanic and you know him, then you know his character. So you've been working on your other truck for five years. If he gonna get over on you, you should know by now. So these mechanic shops, man, are like truck dealerships. It's just an economy that people don't know that exists because they keep it to themselves, man. I, I knew I knew a guy that was a mechanic and he wanted to come out here and drive trucks. Man, he paid two thousand dollars for what do you call that international eagle, that long nose with a with a coming in fourteen red top, man. That truck was worth at least fifty to sixty thousand dollars a couple of years ago before the market started tanking. Right now he can sell that truck for thirty thousand. And all he did was fix the issues because the customers dropped it off and it was like they can't get it to work of an electrical issue. But by him being a mechanic, he said, All right man, I'll buy the truck from y'all. And the thing about these older trucks is that people just so quick to get rid of them because guys don't want to drive old trucks. If you a company driver, you don't want to drive no old truck. You don't want to drive no speed. You don't want to drive no 13 speed. You want to drive a brand new Peterbilt, a brand new Freightliner, comfortable. So when people be getting rid of their trucks, they just ready like, ah, man, just, just take it. They ain't got time to be selling no freaking truck on Facebook, meeting up with people. If you got 35 trucks, you ain't about to go sell nothing. You go, you go, man, let me auction this off. Man, let me put this on the truck. Let me pass this on to the supervisor. Let him handle it. So when your truck at the mechanic shop, that's the easiest place to sell it. You already got to buy it, and you ain't got to tow it out. You ain't got to do nothing. So these mechanics, man, I ain't going to lie to you. If I would do things differently, I would open up a mechanic shop first in that trucking business. So it just makes more sense. You know what I'm saying? But that's 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 how you get a cheap truck. If you get in with your mechanic, you have these conversations. And you get you you make sure you're a part. If you got a truck, you're an operator. You got a mechanic that you know. Just ask them to see if I'm making this up. Just have that conversation like, hey, man, you ever see anybody get a free truck? Or you ever filed a mechanic's lien and took a title over? A lot of them just don't, don't tell you they be in court all the time. These guys, if you got a mechanic shop, you're going to be in court. Because people are going to refuse to pay, and you're going to have to be like, crap, I got to figure out how to take this freaking truck. You know what I'm saying? Hey, I had a guy back, back in like 2010 before I even had a CDL. I took my car to a mechanic. And he, he told me, I'll let you pay me. And I said, okay, cool. I'll pay you, man. Just give me some time. Dude got impatient. Filed a mechanic's lien on me. And my title was in court, wrapped up with him. I had to find the money just to pay this man to get my little Acura back. And so they can get your car. They can get your trailer. They can get anything. But you just got to understand how that business works. And that's how I had the mindset for a $5,000 truck that it is possible. There ain't nothing wrong with that truck. You know? And the drip just keep on dripping, man. All right, let's take it back a little bit, man. Sabotage. You 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 took the truck, you brought the truck, 
You took it to the mechanic that actually worked on the truck for several years. And you come to find out that's the same truck that you wanted that you wanted him to work on it, uh, but he wanted to buy it from you so he could snatch the engine out of it. When when you found out about it, you said, "Nah, let me go ahead and 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 take my business elsewhere." How did you find out that that mechanic was the one that actually did the work, or did the person that sold you the truck told you the mechanic did the work? Yeah, so basically, that guy who owned the truck had it for ten years, and he only let one shop touch it. So that shop had a relationship with the truck. So they felt entitled to it because they've been working with it for so long. So when the guy sold it, he made an emotional decision because he was frustrated with the truck because of the clutch. And so he took it to them to get it fixed. And they must have told him a, a crazy price. They might have said, hey, man, $1,100, 12 13 14 I don't know what that did, though. But whatever it was, I called him at such a good um that he sold me the truck and the mechanic knew because they were, I guess, plotting themselves. You know what I'm saying? That he might have been talking in the air like, man, I might sell this darn truck. They had it in their mind or whatever. So when I bought it, the mechanic actually called my phone saying, hey, man, uh, you, know, you know, I heard you trying to buy the truck and all this and that. I'm like, oh, crap. Like, you know, I got the darn truck still. And he's trying to buy it. So I had to tell him what he wanted to hear. I, I, said, I think I said, I might have said something like, yeah, man, um, I'll think about it or, yeah, I'll come and talk to you. I might have said something like that. But I was just trying to buy myself. And I didn't want to tell him no, because he can easily plug something or do something where, you know, the truck just can't move. And now I got to pay them to figure out what's going on. When you brought the truck, the truck was still in the shop. Yeah, the truck was in the shop. Oh, okay, 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 okay. So the truck was in the, it was still in the shop when you, when you took it over. But, yeah. but from I'm, what I'm, what I'm hearing in the story, is that the the mechanic shop got in their feelings and they was yeah, like, yeah, they was upset. Oh, okay, so they was like upset with the, with the with the dude for selling the truck from up under them because they they knew that he wanted to sell the truck. Why they just didn't make a bid for it? That's the thing. I don't know what conversation took place between him and them, but I knew that they had to be plotting on how to get that truck because of how he approached me when I was in the middle of the transaction. You know, and so he might have heard that the owner might have called the shop to say, hey, I'm selling the truck, man. Uh, a guy going to come and pick it up. And he might be like, oh, crap. And then he's like, who could be enough? What's enough for me? Had an attitude about it. And then that's when I kind of put two and two together. Like, okay, something's going on. This guy want this truck because he understands he worked on the darn truck. And they knew that the truck had a great engine. Got a 207 Detroit, and they've been doing the work for 10 years straight. So he specifically told me, like, hey, man, I got a customer who this engine. And you already know, if they going to take an engine and sell it, they selling that engine alone for no less than $10,000, plus the labor that was in. So that's what we're they is like, man, they're going to make the money off this stuff, truck, truck. You know, uh, but that's as much as I knew. It's speculation, but it's also interesting because, you know, I work around mechanics and getting engines and stuff like that. That's what they do. They want them engines. They want them transmission, customer view parts, you know, and they might have got it five engines. I'll, you'll never know what it'd be after. But that's where that was from. It was on the pressure trying to get that truck pad out of my hand. So. Wow. Five for five, sell for ten. So you 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 already knew it was a potential for them to sabotage the truck, which would have forced you into doing something that you might not wanted to do. That came from a lack of trust, a lack of trust and experience from working at a mechanic shop. I see mechanics make mistakes and they just tell you that something else is wrong with that truck. You do have people that are spiteful. You can't trust people until they prove themselves to be trustworthy or else you'll just be a fool going around trusting everybody. It ain't nothing wrong with moving along with what you see, but in business, relationships, paperwork, rule everything. So I had no relationship with him, and I darn sure didn't have no paperwork with him. So I had no reason to think that he would do anything in my favor, especially having such an interest in that truck, and that he had a lot to lose for going out of his way to call my phone. So I had to, you know, use that mindset to say, okay, it doesn't look good, so let me go get this truck. I didn't even tell him I was coming. You know what I'm saying? And the fan blade was broke. So, you know, if you can't, if the fan blade broke, you know, you can't cool the engine down, it ain't spinning and all that. So I had to go over there, figure out how to take off that fan blade, and I drove that truck straight to time from Portland Avenue, probably like 10 miles. And I just parked it. I'm like, okay, cool. My mechanic that I trust, that I know, 
and I had him fix it, put on a new. Matter of fact, no, he came and did something else. I took that crap on myself because it wasn't hard to take off. Because I had to get the radiator to kind of lean, take the screws off. But I had him do like a wire that was bent on there. Because when the damage it was on the truck was that somebody backed door with a forklift. So they kind of pushed the radiator back. So it kind of looked crazy. It looked way worse than what it was. All it was was a big rod and some bushes. But the mechanics made it seem like it was thousands of dollars worth of work. So that might have been why the guy was pressured to sell it because he don't know. He didn't know how much it cost to get the truck done. And they had a reputation for overcharging. That's what the guys were. Because remember, they've been working on it for 10 years. So I was asking other guys about that shop. Like, hey, man, is that a good shop? What they charge? And everybody said, yeah, man, it's very expensive. So they could have told him, hey, man, you're going to have to get a new radiator. You might have to get a new hook. They might have all kind of crazy stuff, man. Stretch that man out. Whatever they told him, though, I ended up getting that truck, their feet, that that guy didn't want to deal with, whatever was going on. And all I did, man, was put on that new fan blade for $70 and replace that rod. I had did some AT lines and stuff. I had did everything I needed to do because I was putting the driver in. I wanted a driver to come down. That was it. All right, you've been an owner-operator for a couple of years. Uh, you do have a couple of trucks in your fleet, and you had put drivers in it. How hard was it for you to find those particular drivers to drive your trucks? I want to say off the top that I don't have a couple of trucks in my fleet. I actually have one truck. I did have a couple of trucks, but when everything got so tight with the freight earlier last year, I decided to sell one of my trucks and downsize to one truck. And I got in my truck and started driving again and, you know, let my driver go because it got so tight with profit margins that it just didn't make sense. But as far as finding drivers, as far as, you know, putting them in a truck, it's very difficult for most people. And I don't mean to say it this way to make it sound cocky or to make myself seem special. But I think finding drivers is the easy part. And that's because the way I go about it is a lot different than most. A driver wants to take advantage of you as a, as a, as a, as a business owner. His mindset is to come make some money and get over it any way he can. Most drivers go steal away from people that they feel like they just don't want to work with for various reasons. It, it could be whatever. I'm very approachable. So automatically people feel like, oh, I can come take advantage of this guy. Be nice. You know what I'm saying? He don't know. He don't seem like he's a threat. You know, ain't that, you know what I'm saying? I don't, I don't come off like a CEO. So I'm very approachable. So they don't, they don't feel threatened. So automatically it makes it to where when I'm dealing with people, it's very easy to get them to come work for me. Because of my personality. I've learned a lot from that is that, you know, you're going to take a lot of losses being approachable. And that's the reason why a lot of CEOs and bosses act the way they do towards drivers. You know, a little bit, you know, hostile attitudes and kind of micromanaging and stuff like that. All that stuff people don't like, I do the opposite. But that's the reason why they do it. Because they know that drivers, they want to, they want to get over. And I don't mean to make it seem like that, but when you go get your money, you ain't worried about the next guy. You're trying to make your money. You know what I'm saying? You got good drivers, too. But you do have a lot of drivers who, you know, they'll have been, they may not be able to find no job easy like that. You may you may, you may, may never check their DAC score. You may, you may never check their PSP. So I think that it's very easy to find guys. Uh, but what's difficult is finding somebody that is going to do you good and uh, y'all going to have a great relationship. They're going to show up every day. They're going to work hard. They're going to be loyal. I think that's difficult because no matter how good you are as a business owner, you can't predict people's behavior. And that's what, you know, we're human beings. So no one can tell what somebody's going to do, but you can only hope that they do the right thing. Like I said, I've learned so much from hiring guys, man. I've hired 10 guys at this point, five company and five owned operators that I've, you know, ran on to me under my numbers and stuff like that. And uh, I've learned a ton from working with people, how to get drivers, ways of going about it. I actually want to make this announcement too, now that you brought the question up, because I know that finding drivers, good drivers, is very difficult. I actually created a software where you'll be able to see uh, reviews on drivers and you can find drivers with just the click of a button. You don't got to pay thousands of dollars to no staff and agency. You don't got to pay nobody to recruit for you. I created an app where you can go on there and you can just look at people and see what people say about them. If they got any reviews and you can leave a review on them. 
So I created a system of accountability for the trucking industry. I've never seen anything like it. I don't think there's anything that exists like that as far as technology is concerned. And, it, and it's called Easy Go Manager. Um, it's not released yet. There's the website, v.easygomanager.com. You can sign up for it. There's a lot of free stuff on there. It's very, very cheap subscriptions. And I wanted to make it that way because I wanted, you know, for the trucking community, we spend so much money, it's not funny. So I wanted us to be able to grow our businesses, find drivers, find good business-to-business relationships without all of the, you know, the stuff that goes on that doesn't work in our favor, you know. So, you know, hopefully y'all check that out, EasyGo Manager, www.easygomanager.com. And, uh, yeah, that, that's my take on finding drivers. What's what's the website again? www.easygo Manager www.easygoldmanager.com. There you have it, owner operators. Go ahead and check that out and uh, see uh, if some qualified drivers on there that can come and uh, drive for you right quick. Winston, man, listen, yeah. you 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 made a good point about finding and keeping drivers. The driver that's going to come and treat you right. The driver that's going to come and see your vision. The driver that's going to come and help you grow your company. But back again, when I was saying about jealousy in the trucking industry, there are these not so great drivers that's looking at your pocket as a as a young black entrepreneur businessman. And I, I, I want to say it's more prevalent in the black sector of owner operators because i i have talked to plenty of young black entrepreneur owner operators that ran trucks and they try to help try to help their their own and all like that but it seems like their own is the ones that's messing them up have you have you came across of any drivers that 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 uh, that put you under because it only it only takes that one driver to mess up that one truck to mess up your whole company. Yeah, that's correct. I've had a guy that stole $1,700 from me earlier this year. He was on the operator. I hired him on. He said he had no money and he wanted to get started in flatbed. So I went out and I bought all his chains and binders. You know, I spent all together $1,700 getting him going, not just on equipment, but just everything overall. Because, you know, he ran some loads and I paid him out. And he had promised to pay for certain things and the insurance and all of that. So everything added up. And uh, that guy said his truck was down and it was at a mechanic shop. And he kept saying that for a couple of days to the point where I told him, like, hey, man, you on my insurance. I'm paying it. And, and your truck is down. I said, you know, I'm at a tough spot, but you got to communicate and let me know when you coming back. He never answered my phone and uh, he never answered my text message. After a couple of weeks. I told him, I said, hey, man, if you can just give me my EOD back, because I got to pay for that. You know, if you could just return my fuel cards, he never responded. So I was forced to file a claim with the DOT just so they know that all this stuff, you know, has officially been stolen. And I don't want to get in trouble, you know what I'm saying? Having no EOD out there or whatever out there that ain't got nothing to do with it. I need records. I was going to do a small claim, but I said, nah, I'm not going to pursue it because it's my fault. I should have been a smarter businessman. And if he got over on me, that's my week. I just left it alone. Plus, I mean, you know, we just didn't take the time to do it. Still might pursue it, but as of right now, I had, I, had, I learned a valuable lesson from, from hiring people and hiring that guy. It don't matter how people look, they story, they smile with you. None of that matters. You can never predict what a person is going to do. The best thing you can do for yourself is make sure that you're keeping business 100% business and never take a loss that you can't afford to pay for. I had the money at that time to do that, to play like that. So I took a risk that I could afford. But imagine if I would have took a risk, $3,000 risk that I could not afford. Yeah, that would have probably took me down. So I feel like when you doing, you know, hiring drive, doing all that, calculate your risk first and find out how much room you have to do certain things. And you have to take those risks as a business, unfortunately, you know. But you can't see it coming. I think the best protection for yourself, aside from calculating your risk, is just stop trying to be the CEO, man. Stop trying to be that man. You the man. I'm the CEO. The buck stops at me. If you got a problem, call my phone. We need to know how to structure Put people in places of power in your company. Put them in position. Have somebody to blame. Get yourself a CEO and you just be the owner and nobody don't know it's you. Because the moment they know it's you, them biases, you know, those limitations and that attitude comes in. So as far as right now, I don't own anything. Everything goes through my wife. And I don't seem to have a lot of issues with, you know, as much as envy goes. 
when they when people are dealing with a woman or whatever. You know what I'm saying? So I think that we just have to learn how to take a step back and stop trying to run the show because we want the spotlight, you know, you got a truck, it's my business, it's my name. You don't need to be the face to make the money, you know. It's gonna come. You just gotta know how to structure it. So that's my take on it. Man, I'm I'm sitting here enjoying the conversation from my man Winston right now. Let's give him a round of applause. This man is dropping jewels, dropping the drip, and letting you guys know the T. Make sure you guys hit that like button because this this the one right here. This this the one right here. And my man's still young. Still young. And 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 talking like talking like a man in his 50s right now. Like a man that been owning a business for over 60 years right now. Come on now. Come on. Winston, man. With all these uh, bad drivers out here, and it, it's unfortunate. And I, I want to apologize. I don't want people to think that I'm just saying that it's only one-sided because it, it's bad drivers all across the board. Whether you're black, white, Hispanic, it's it's a lot of it's a lot of bad drivers that take advantage of of young owner oper owner operators. They doesn't have to be any of, of any color or nationality. And I want to apologize for making it think that but i'm just saying it just seems like the variance so if you guys look at the variance then i hope you guys will understand what i'm saying look advantages man it, it's just way too many of these drivers are taking advantage of of young owner operators such as yourself man why why is that? Why why is that all these drivers just feel that they can you know, they come and give you the sob story like the one like the one driver did and and you you felt you you felt like hey okay well let me go ahead and get this man a chance and 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 let him rock out with me but there's so many drivers out here that has that that same taking advantage opportunistic feel why 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 in your opinion why is that man i think because it's a natural response to survival you know what i'm saying people if 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 somebody drowning, you know, the natural response is to panic and to take down whoever is trying to help them. That's why, you know, lifeguards have to be trained in order to save somebody. I mean, think about that. You, know, you got to be trained just to save somebody. It's not just, you just, oh, I'm about to go save somebody. No, it, no let the lifeguard go because he know what he's doing. So I think that it's a natural response that business People that, you know, want to be entrepreneurs, they get in business and they want what they they want. They want to survive and they feel like, you know, if, if, if I'm going down or whatever and I'm panicking, hey, if I'm in your truck, I might take your truck down with me or I might take your business down with me. You know what I'm saying? So I feel that in order to spot somebody that has a level head, you got to know what's going on in their personal world also. So, for example, I found out that hiring felons seems to be a, a good way to go because somebody with a felony with a second chance opportunity, they don't have a, they don't, they can't play around like a lot of people. If I'm hiring a guy that got 20 years experience in, clean, in a clean CDL versus a guy that had been in prison for 20 years with, with two years CDL, I'm more nervous over the 20 year guy because that 20 year guy can go get any job. That 20 year guy might have a check coming in every month. His wife might have a great job and he don't, he's not motivated to work like that. He's been in it 20 years. So to, to him, he doesn't seen it all. And in his mind, oh, you, you don't really know yet. And you, you know, I've been do, I, I drive, I drive. You can't rush him. You can't tell him to slow down. You just got to take what you get with, with them, with them experienced drivers. So I feel like when you're dealing with people with felonies or they have children they got to see or, you know, they might have a blemish on their license and they just can't get certain opportunities. I feel like those people think more clear than somebody that has a million different opportunities. They got all these jobs calling. They're trying to be an owner operator, too. You know, I, I actually had a very good relationship with a friend of mine until I hired him. And once I hired this guy, he wanted what I had. He wanted to be an owner operator. And it caused him to be very frustrated with me just naturally. Just naturally, man. Like one time the AC went out and I said, yeah, we're going to get it fixed. But this man was red hot. And it wasn't just because of the heat outside. It was because in his mind, I want to drive my own truck with AC. I don't want to be in your truck, man. And he was very frustrated 
because he's in the process of buying his own truck and he's still having to work up on me and all that. And to him, nah, man, I got to get moving. So now I'm going to argue back. Now I'm going to wear my emotions on my sleeve. Now all of a sudden, it's too hot to be talking to you on the phone right now. I'll, I'll call you back. I ain't about to be arguing with you. Attitude and, you know, no respect for structure. You know, I don't talk to nobody that's over me in any form of way with a disrespect tone because to me, you're more accomplished. So if anything, I, I feel like it's wiser just to kind of hold my tongue and hold my peace. Especially, you know, it's different if you be, but I'm not a disrespectful guy. I wasn't, I was never yelling or cursing at this man, but he was highly frustrated being that his goal was to become an owner operator, but he's up under me, which is frustrating. So no matter what I did, it don't matter if that AC was working, this man was still mad at all kind of stuff. Like I offered to pay him more money. That wasn't enough because he knew he could make more money in his own truck. So, you know, he had no felonies. His wife had a great job. She was like a nurse practitioner or something like that. And he had a house. He had equity. So he had a lot of room to give me problems. So give me somebody that got all kind of issues. You know, they got they in an apartment, an apartment raising the rent. They got a bad credit score. And, you know what I'm saying? They can't go forward to buy a truck. It's unfortunate. But those be the people sometimes that they're going to work. They're going to work. They don't have all these opportunities, so they're going to show up because they really need the money. You know what I'm saying? And and, and they, they got a longer stretch to go. So, yeah, you think it's good to hire a married man and, he you know, he, he look good. And as far as on the outside, he look presentable. That, that look nice enough. But it might be that little young dude with them dreads that show up every day and he got five kids and three baby mamas and child support. It might be him that do way better than that guy with his shirt tucked in and, and he got everything well kept and a clean, great credit score. He might be the worst person to hire. He, you never know. But, you know, it, it, it came from hiring people and judging character and the guys with responsibilities, to me, appeared to be better candidates. And this, and this guy that you just got finished talking about, that was your... That was your buddy. That was your your man. They got they got more than my buddy, man. That guy actually was the man who baptized him. Man, we met each other like seven years prior. Yeah, we met seven years prior in church, and seven years later, he wanted to get a CDL, and I taught him how to drive a ten speed truck because he he had a CDL by that time, but he did not know how to drive a ten speed. So I hired him. I taught him how to do it. Trained him up for about two, three weeks, and you know he was he was he was in a good position. He had money, great you know wife, and great support system. And again, that natural instinct of survival and him wanting to you know be an owner operator and do his thing caused him to ruffle both of our feathers and to take both of us down, so to speak, you know, figuratively speaking, you know, because of how he's trying to go about it. But it's a natural reaction because he, in his mind, he got to get it. You know, he need to get out here and he need to, he ain't got time to waste. So I understand it. Not that I agree with it, but now I know hey, right, next time, if you so good and you, you know, you, you got all this going on, I don't know if I want to work with you. Let me give it to the guy who's the opposite, the guy who got problems, you know, he, he got some issues. He might, that guy might really come to work, man. That's how I look at it. Wow. A friend turned enemy. That's ain't good gonna, now. Hey, we good? Oh, y'all good. I, I, I would never, yeah, yeah. I would never allow him to be my enemy. So I made sure that I separated the business from the personal experience that we had because I felt like that personal relationship was more valuable than the time we spent working together. So I traded it. I was like, all right, I'm not going to let that, you know what I'm saying, allow me to look at him differently. I just look at it like the business side, that ain't for me and you. But me shaking your hand and smiling, I can do that. But I'm not going to hold hard feelings. I do feel emotions. Don't get me wrong, I'm human. But I'm not going to let it keep me from saying that I see you when I walk the other way. I'm not going to do that. I'm, I'm, hey, hey, man, what's up? I might still be offended. I might still be like, man, I can't believe you did me like that, man. But I'm not going to let it blind me and become, you know what I'm saying, a person that I don't like. So I like speaking to people. I like, hey, what's going on? I don't like turning my head or holding a grudge, you know, but I am a passionate person and I don't like, I don't like, you know what I'm saying, when I'm disrespected for trying to help, stuff like that. And I don't play the victim role either. I just know now that, yeah, being a great businessman comes from learning. And I never had a teacher. I've had people that gave me great advice. 
and I've seen great business in it, and I've took lessons from them. But I believe I need more experience. You know, I got to grow more and I got to make better business decisions. You know, have a trucking business. So I, I take the blame for everything. I don't ever look at oh, somebody did me wrong. I look at it like, okay, it's something I didn't know. It's something I, I should have learned. It's something I should have seen coming. What can I do to prevent this from happening again? What lessons did I learn from it? That's how I look at uh, business right now. All lessons learned, man. And that's what we need to do uh, when we're running a business. 90% of 90% of great businesses learn from a lot of failures. Nobody did not become great overnight. Uh, there, there was a lot of trials and tribulations with, with a lot of things. And, and learning from those trials and tribulations and putting it towards uh, what you which now going into the new experience that you're going to be doing in the future definitely helps out man let's uh, change gears for a minute before we get on up out of here and i do appreciate the awesome awesome conversation winston man we I'm, I'm having a good time just just listening to you just just soaking up all the drip man i'm i'm, I'm here like spongebob bro early early this year i'd say maybe about a couple of months back there was a young lady social media lady she she was on a, she was on a podcast which which kind of like brought her out but she been she been doing her thing on instagram for for a long time and uh, and you was able to get in contact uh, with her her name is kira she's go by the moniker of the trucking guru and uh, everybody knew uh, what happened with that uh, controversy right there you you had a TikTok. i'm i wasn't sure if you was if you got in contact with her but have you got in contact with her and if so how how did that conversation go my goal was never to make millions doing nothing i just want to keep the lights on i wanted my kids to be able to get new shoes like i just wanted bare necessity all right y'all so today i woke up to some comments from kiara henderson i clicked on her profile i shot her a message out of curiosity and it turns out that it's the real kiara henderson she shot me her number we got on a phone call and today we're going to be dropping a video if you guys have anything specific on your mind that you want to know leave that down below in the comment section and i will be asking these questions i already know it's a lot going on this is the trucking community so i'm going to keep it trucking you guys so i need for you to tune in and also like i said comment down below whatever's on your mind and i'm gonna make sure i ask those questions Cool. So you had Kiara on one of my videos. She commented to correct something that, you know, me sharing the video that Spencer made, she wanted to correct something on, on, on what he was saying. Uh, and I responded by saying, hey, you know, are you a real Kiara? Because, you know, I didn't know if it was a fake account. And it turned out to be her. And she agreed to speak to me on uh, my channel. Uh, I set it up. I reached out, called her phone. And she was like, okay, let's do it. When it became time to do it, she told me something came up. There was an emergency. So I said, all right, we'll do it the next day. I reached uh, no answer. I waited till the weekend. Called her, and she said, yeah, let's do it. I said, all right, let's do that at 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock came. She commented on one of the videos I did about her. And she wanted to correct something that was said. And I inboxed her. I said, are you the real Keela Henderson? And she said, yeah. And she gave me her number. I called. She agreed that she would come on and talk to me about the situation. And I could ask her any question. So I said, all right, let's do it. When it became time, uh, she told me the emergency happened that she wasn't able to come on. So I said, okay. The next day, I, I tried to do it again, the, the, the recording. She, she never answered. So I said, all right, I'll wait till the weekend. Called her that weekend. She answered and said, let's do it. Uh, 7 o'clock came. That was the time we agreed on. And she never answered. She she didn't respond to my text. She didn't respond to my call. So I said, hey, I'm just going to leave it at that. The conversation that we had, she appeared to be very genuine. She appeared to stick with her story. And when I say appeared, I mean, she didn't give a different vibe of uh, being in that type of setting on a personal level with me on the other, me on her phone. She came off as exactly what you see online. Like, you know, I own a hundred trucks and, you know, I made all this money. That's that's how, that's how her attitude was. She was very confident in what she was saying, but you know, that that's how that went. You know, so I still have not really doubled back to pursue an episode with her. I just kind of took that as, as just, you know, the way she moves, so. Okay. Yeah, well, that's sound, that sounds, about how I do it. I I reach out to these guests a long time ago. I used to chase down a lot of people that I meet 
on yeah. Facebook, a lot of people that I meet on Instagram, YouTube. I'll send them an email or if I come across a phone number, I'll send them a text or they in my messenger, I'll send them a, a message. And I used to set, set, set opportunities up. And, and some of them was successful, uh, some of them wasn't. Uh, there was a couple of them that I that I seen that was on like social media, like like uh, action, something happened and somebody reported on it and I reached out to them to, to, to chop it up with them to see what happened. Somebody died in the truck and that person that recorded the video was right there talking about it. I was interested in it, reached out to them, set something up and it never, it never happens. It never happens. With me, I look at it this way. I'm like, well, I'm going to start looking at it as uh, three times. If if I reach out to you on the third time and I still get no response or anything like that, I'm just not going to I'm just not going to mess with it no more. And I had people that re-reach back out to me and like, oh yeah, okay, yeah, let's let's talk about it. Let's go. Let's go. And I'm like, I'm not interested in it no more. And then they'll get mad at me like, oh, well, you spent all that time trying to get at me and this, that, and the third. And I'm like, bro, that was like maybe about a month ago, about two months ago, when when it was fresh in my head. You coming at me like two months now, like I'm not interested. So don't get mad at me. I'm 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 sorry. I'm I just lost interest in it. So that's how I do it. I, I'll reach out. Like, I just recently reached out to a young lady via TikTok. She shared a story about a truck driver being, what happened? A truck driver being stranded. Good topic, right? Hey, let's, 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 let's talk about it. Let's, let's get that to a broader audience. Oh, I, I got a, I got an audience of maybe 4 million that's, that that watched the channel so let's get let's let's get that out there you 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 on your tiktok is going to go viral because of what you're talking about and you can generate more people but you can get much more interest interest outside of that and that's what i was bringing i i set it up with her we had to behind the conversation because with tiktok you have to you have to follow one another in order to to connect with one another so we set it up. I sent her the email for the for the podcast release because I wanted to make sure that everybody know that when I'm talking to them, that the content is mine. You know what I'm saying? So she felt out the she felt out the release, and we were supposed to get together and and nothing, nothing. I, I reached back to her twice again. Like I said, I do the three time thing, and I, the last message I sent to her was, "Hey, thank you for the opportunity. I hope the driver made it home safe and all like that." I I still follow you because she made several TikToks after that, saying that the, the TikTok community came together and help was able to help the driver. And I was like, "Cool. I was thank you." So yeah, I I don't push it. I guess with everything that went on, it pretty much died down now. I don't think too many people is is talking about it right now, but but at the height of it, at the height of the controversy, she's she wasn't the only one. Like she's not the only one that 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 claims turnkey businesses. Being that you are owner operator and you you went through the mud to get all your stuff, what's your thoughts about 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 people that's offering a turnkey style business like just give me 10 15k and i will go out and i will get the driver and i would get the truck and i i i and all you have to do is just sit there and 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 just collect the money what's your thoughts on 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 a turnkey business style that way all right um now what i think about the turnkey business is that it's one of the greatest setups for you to fail as a person that's providing that service. So for anybody that's thinking about ext extending that to anybody, I think it's one of the worst setups for failure. And I can explain why. Early on uh, last year, I thought I was doing so well that I had a buddy that was real close to me that wanted to do this idea of a turnkey business. And he just wanted to buy some trucks and he wanted to, you know what I'm saying, get in the business, so to speak. You know, as an owner operator, you run into those type of things. So because I was aware that, you know, I could just make this automated for him, I said, well, I'm, I'm going to do that. I said, I'm going to help him do that because in my mind, he don't know nothing about the business. So it's going to be very difficult to try to run a business with somebody who don't know anything. He didn't want to get a CDL. All he want to do is flip his money. So I'm like, okay, cool. 
I'm going to help him buy a truck. You know what I mean? He don't know how to talk to drivers, so I'm going to help him find a driver. So this business model is very natural. It's not, it's not something that somebody just came up with to scam people. No, it's a natural business. It happens all the time. We all have people that we know that want to come make money. It can come from family. Shoot, I had people that I didn't know from my wife's side of the family that said they want to invest in the trucking business. And they heard that we got a business and they coming to us. So it's very natural. The issue is when you be like, okay, man, I'm going to do this for a business. I'm going I'm to be a key professional. I'm going to go, if I can do this with one person, I'm going to do it with 50 people. The issues I ran into when I tried that is that people do not like to hold themselves accountable. That's the difference between being successful and being and failing. The ones who have practiced accountability usually make it further. So everything that went wrong with me trying to help my friend, I ended up having to take the blame and the accountability for every single and now today, when I look back at it, I'm like, man, that's the dumbest thing I've ever did is to tell somebody that I'm going to do all this stuff and all you got to do is just fund it. And I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to find your drivers. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. It was the most, it was the worst thing I've ever tried to do. And it came from a good place because my intention was to help my friend make some money. But the problem with trucking is you can't control when that truck breaks down. You can't control when the freight is not there. You can't control when the drivers quit. You can't control that. So you have to take the blame. And this is where the problem comes in at, is that if you got enough people blaming you, you're a fake guru now. Even if you start off good, and a lot of times people start off good. People start off very good, being a good person, like, oh, I'm going to help some family. I'm going to help some friends. And now I'm going to help the world. And I'm not saying you don't have the scammers out there, too, because you got them. But you, it's easy to spot the scammers, though. Like, when I say the real scammers, I'm talking about the people who don't know nothing about trucking, and they're talking about doing turnkey. You know they don't know nothing about trucking. But the ones who do, I'm pretty sure they started off right here. Okay, so it's, it's, it's just a business that can easily fall apart. And that's the issue with it, is that uh, you're trying to do everything for somebody. And that's not a good business right there. Uh, if you're going to do turnkey, a turnkey in itself is not a bad thing. It's just that there's too many variables involved. If you're going to do turnkey, you make sure that person that's involved, that, that person you're doing it for, is involved in the business themselves. They run in the business, and you just put this stuff together for them. But don't try to take all this money out of somebody and, and say, I'm going to do a turnkey. You better, you're better off taking a small percentage and saying, hey, I, don't, I want you to understand the business, whether you want it to be turnkey or not. You need to be a part of this. You need to know what's going on at all times, and you need to be in this room. And I think that's a better approach. I'm not against turnkey. I just think that it's a little bit unrealistic. It's an unreal unrealistic expectation expectation for both parties. It's very difficult to do that type of business. If somebody's out there and they successful at it, hey, they might have a lot of money for them issues that go wrong. Or they might have a good reimbursement program, I guess. But yeah, that's what I think about the turnkey. Very very rough way to do a business. All right, so on top of that turnkey business, there's also the business of people selling, selling trucking. And what by that, I could teach you how to be a dispatcher. I could teach you how to how to do this, and I could teach you how to do that. A lot of a lot of people they jumped on board trying to, to do the dispatching thing, but a lot of them had failed at it. What what's your take as far as going on Instagram and you see a hot young lady over here? They're trying to sell you this course about trucking dispatches. What's, what's your thoughts about that? All right, I think supply and demand is where we can start with something like that, right? You have a lot of demand for information. So, heck, you have a lot of people supply it and try to fill that gap because they see that it's not just, again, it's a natural thing because when you're posting about your business, you're going to have all these people saying, hey, show me, show me, I want to learn. I probably got 70 messages from people wanting to learn right now. So a couple of years ago, when I first started, before all everybody got online trying to sell courses, my whole idea was to teach people how to do this. That was my whole MO. And it was coming from a good place because I'm like, man, I'm taking care of my kids and I'm providing. I want my friends to do this too. I want to help young black men too. Hey, man, y'all come home and get this CDL. Let me show y'all how to do this. So it's a natural thing. Now, for the scammers that's in it, it's artificial. They don't have a passion for helping people. They just got a passion for making money. And that's where the, the, the wires get crossed at. 
because you have good people out here that's passionate about education like myself that just want to teach you, hey, I ain't trying to charge you $1,000 to teach you anything because I don't believe me charging you $1,000 is going to help you. It's going to help me, but it's not going to help you. So I'll say, hey, man, I'll charge you $10, but I'd rather teach a million people off of $10 than to teach one person for a million dollars because I ain't got nothing that's going to make you a millionaire trying to pay me to, to make you money. I ain't got nothing that is going to be that significant. At least in my mind, I just know everything's a process. And if you want to learn trucking from me, it's going to be a process. You ain't about to get rich off of this stuff overnight. So I don't want to charge you something that I feel is not fair. Everybody don't think like that. Some people look at it like, nah, my time, you know, is everything. I'm going to charge twenty, two, you know, two thousand dollars for this. That's fine. I don't knock. I don't knock a hustler or a businessman or anybody that's uh, out making money because my problem is not with them. It's kind of like, and my phone is not dropping, right? Nah, you're good. You're good. Okay, I look at it like this: like, 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 if somebody in a relationship they get cheated on, right? A lot of people will get mad at the person they cheated with. Like a guy might get upset at another guy and be like, hey, man, I heard you calling my girl. A lot of people take that approach. I don't do that. If if a woman cheat, she's the person that I need to be talking to. Hey, you cheated. I don't care about who you did it with. That don't matter to me because they, I don't have no ties with them. I don't have no anger towards them. So the way I look at courses and stuff is that I'm looking at the person like, hey, man, y'all that's buying the courses, y'all need some accountability. Y'all need some accountability because y'all not just innocent because y'all buying a course and y'all got scammed. It don't make you a victim because a lot of times people are able to sell courses from a lie. They not really living that lifestyle. They don't really have that money, but that's what sells the course. It's not the information. It's the lifestyle. It's the looks. It's the glamour. So when people buy information, they're not buying no information from a genuine place. They want a new car. They want a new diamond. And they're looking at all that glamour. People who want real information, they know for a fact that they don't want to be distracted by glamour. They just want the blueprint so they can try. So good information doesn't get sold. It just sits on the shelf because it's not packaged right. But that's anything that's good for you sits on the shelf. You know what I'm saying? People... People, people learning how to eat now in our time, but typically people will go to McDonald's a lot quicker than they'll go at a salad bar. You know what I'm saying? So these gurus will continue selling courses because they know how to package it. Sometimes it's not great information, but it's a great packaging. And educators like myself don't have a great packaging. I don't have a flashy car to show you. I don't have a mansion to show you. I don't have 30 trucks that I said I had. You know what I'm saying? I don't have none of that. I just have good information. So I don't move as many as, as many classes as other people would. You know what I'm saying? But that's because my, my interest is education. So I'll take this road over saying, okay, let me go make a million dollars off these people real quick uh, because, because people are trying to buy something. So that's how I look at it. You know what I mean? I look at people like, hey, man, y'all got to be more educated. It, it, it's, just a, it's just a problem because if you're a passionate teacher and you see your students are not focused, it hurts you. But do you quit your job? Do you walk away from that salary that you're getting to say, well, they're not really learning, so I'm going to quit being a teacher? No, you keep going and you take your money and you and you try to be as passionate as you can. So that's how I look at it. You know what I'm saying? If you out there, you're trying to sell classes and courses and stuff, and the people not genuine, they just trying to get rich. I mean, if you really trying to help people, continue. You might help two people, but that's better than nothing. That's how I look at it because I have classes too. So I can't, you know, be a hypocrite and say classes are bad. The classes aren't bad. It's the people that has bad intentions and they're just trying to get in your pocket. And, you know, that's how I look at it. Winston, everybody. Awesome conversation, man. I'm I'm in awe. I'm I'm in awe of you, bro. I I learned in 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 our little in our little session right here. I I learned a lot, man. I learned a lot about the trucking. I learned a lot about accountability. You know what I'm saying? Learned how to how to even save some money, bro. I, th I thank you for that, man. Thank you very much for that. Thank you for coming back on, chopping it up with me, man. Let's let's definitely do it again, bro. Man, I had an awesome, I had an awesome time, man. My voice will be back next time. You say your voice will be back next time. That's what's up, man. I, I, man, go ahead and promote that website one more time and promote how people can actually get in contact with you. Well, what's your, what's your social medias? Okay, so y'all can look me up, Winston P. Strategist on all platforms. And, uh, you know, you'll see that link to www.easygo.com. 
manager.com. Y'all see that link in my bio. It's on all my pages, my YouTube, TikTok, Instagram. You know, we're going to come to Snapchat. We're going to come to Twitter. But for now, you can catch us on YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram, with the Peace Strategist. And, uh, you, know, I, you know, my main thing is, is just educating yourself on this business and aligning yourself with all the things that people don't necessarily talk about you know they talk about truck you worry about the freight you know they talk about a lavish lifestyle you worry about you know what i'm saying just building a business because all that stuff will come if you structure it right so i'm still in a fight myself i don't want nobody to look at me than more than what i am you know what i'm saying so if anything that i've said uh, helps y'all in any form of way that's good enough for me so i appreciate everybody thank you for having me shout out uh shout out to lockout man podcast man y'all tune in y'all check them out you know no platform man really cool guy i definitely support him i made sure i spent as much time as you needed me to be on here man because i respect the platform and i respect it. so y'all check in with him man uh, tune in to the podcast listen to everything else that he got man and that's it